Is, are there stories behind all this software came about? Because really, when you think about it, there's no reason for any of this to exist. Like, it's just too small a community. This exists because, you know, people, they did the numbers and they did it anyway, really. Got a little bit frustrated because I couldn't really find diagrams that were accurately fitted to the rough that I had. This is really working the way I want it to. And did I like buy something that I shouldn't have? And why am I going to all this effort to try and create a custom design for it? I cut a, cut a couple of ovals and got really interested in design. And, and I had a background in computer software. I went, mm, this is... This is interesting. <laughs> this was appealing to me because I could work out the math with the angles around the stone and figure out what the angles were. So if I can do that, well, surely I can model the entire stone and work out angles and indexes for the whole thing. There's, there's gotta be a better way. My math background came into play and I should be able to, to do it mathematically. That's that's what it comes down to. There's no way that I'll ever get my time back, that, you know, the money that I could have been doing databases. Now I get a new tool, people get a new tool, I get to meet people, I get to be, you know, be thrown into a community and maybe inspire the next generation of tool makers to, to push what I've done. It was in the mid 60s. We both worked for Boeing and Boeing has a mineralogical club. So I contacted them and I said, uh, who, who can I contact about fastening up here? And they said, oh, you need to talk to Norm Steele. <laughs> and so I, I contacted Norm. We had a Seattle fastening club and Norm was kind of the head of that. Our, our accounts complemented each other. His approach was, was geometric and mine was algebraic to the, to the fastening design problem. He, he is a man who, who could chew up work. I mean, he could do the work of 10 men, many interests. See, I started fastening in the, in the mid 70s. At the time, it, the rule was you did six standard drive and then a couple of emeralds, and then you were ready to advance on to something else. I said, well, okay, I'll try an oval. I, I looked up ovals and uh, like uh, Vargas, none of them worked. And Vargas worked to were not inaccurate. Uh, they just weren't accurate enough to, to actually cut from. 42 plus or minus five, that, that's not good enough. So we had our, all of Vargas's books, diagrams for faceting. If uh, you try to cut one of those, the, the there could be like a, a five degree angle spread on, you know, it's like cut this facet at, you know, 40 to 47 degrees. It's like, ah, which one is it? Yeah. At that time, newsletters circulated by mail in the United States. Our clubs would just, copy and paste diagrams from each other, basically hand-drawn. Some of them used hand calculators, uh, others were were not. Uh, I guess notoriously, some of them would have like uh, all the index numbers listed for the girdle facets, but they were all at different mass heights. You didn't know that ahead of time. He had started this Seattle Faster Design Notes uh, all, all by hand. My contribution to the newsletter was, was very little. He, he turned it out, he ended up using PageMaker, but he would put it together, it was total, totally his work. You know, he would uh, he would prepare a Seattle Fashion Design note and, and present it at each meeting. That was the main main emphasis of each meeting. And then I would I would check them before he, before he printed them and mailed them out. Well, he, he, sometimes it was not a new design, it was just Norm would, uh, would, uh, would critique any, any published design. That was what one of the things he did. Is any in design published, he, he had to get it in his database, and then uh, and then critique it. There's, they were all wrong, of course. <laughs> so well, this there's, there's got to be a better way. My math background came into play, and I said, well, if an oval is an ellipse, so uh, I should be able to to do it mathematically. So I started doing a mathematical version of an oval. At first, I would just do the outlines. At that time, we still didn't have a way of doing accurate designs. Norm would do designs on paper. He, he, he liked descriptive geometry. Well, Vargas, as you know, his, his design said, well, cut to 42 degrees plus or minus five. It, eventually, we, we came up with the, the uh, design equations to do actually a, a, a three-dimensional design in two dimensions. And those are the equations in volume one of the books. And using the uh, first scientific calculator, which you could buy now for 10 or $15, cost me $600. 
I, I took Norm's drawings, converted them to algebraic equations, and then we could put those on, on the calculator. I, I use TI calculators. Norm liked to use the Packard's with inverse nota notation. I didn't like that. Um, we, we computed the designs to six decibel accuracy. Uh, we, we published them into one decibel accuracy. And uh, uh, one, one time we tried two decibels and got a lot of flack. <laughs> Design programs now use two, two decibel accuracy. It's what the program's like. Uh, it's not necessary for fastening. You did it on a piece of paper with one symmetry segment. You just did one quarter of it. You make, make the drawing, number each point, number each facet, and then eventually you end up with one quarter of the finished design. The software was, was put on the calculator. We eventually moved to uh, programmable calculators and, and the program ran it into, into the programmable calculators. Uh, they were very difficult to use. And we moved to to, uh, to the PC. Uh, I had an IBM and uh, Norm liked Hewlett Packard, so we had a Hewlett Packard. We had some compatibility problems there. So uh, we, we moved the program to, uh, to the PC. Along the way, we added a uh, pen plotter to, to plot the, the drawings. It's a, a mechanical thing which, which uh, has an ink pen and it moves per your instructions and draws a, a line where you, wherever you tell it to, on a pin down. Well, you had to tell it what to, how to draw it. You had to tell it, uh, go, to, go to point X, Y, put the pin down, draw the line from, from, from point A to point B, oh, okay. and then pin up. <laughs> like the, the, uh, all the drawings in, uh, in uh, the introduction to, to meet point fasting, those were all done with the pin plotter. The PC came out in uh, uh, 83, 84. Once we came to the PCs, we had the uh, storage capacity to actually make the drawing. The points go into an array, the, the facet angles go into an array, and, and you can and, and you come up with a plot routine, and, uh, and it'll make the drawing for you. The, the software, which, which actually I wrote, um, there were three people in the world that could use it, me, Norm, and Fred Van Zant. Fred, Fred, he was using a, a Mac, so he had to translate it to, to the Mac language. Fred's original program were, were Mac programs converted to the Mac. But then he added many, many extensions to it, very, very good extensions, like how to, how to calculate a, a, a checkerboard. Fred Van Zant uh, was a noted designer who ha yeah. also had his own design software. He had a software that ran on the Mac. I spent a day or two with him uh, at his home in California and saw him uh, use his software. It, it was quite intriguing. You had to do a lot of bookkeeping on the side to keep track of points and line segments. But he had a very intriguing idea. His idea was he saw a facet design as a, the top view of a tent. And your job as a, on the computer is to figure out how tall all of the tent poles are to make that faceting diagrams. Me, I've always envisioned it as like a, you know, cutting away a solid on a faceting machine, but his approach to design is a lot more geometrical just from the line drawing of the stone. So he would start with a two-dimensional drawing and then work out the height of his point to make, to make everything come out. Uh, even indexing and things like that. You know, just to enter a round brilliant was a lot of bookkeeping and scratch pad stuff on the side. <laughs> uh, he made it available. I don't know how many people used it. Any Mac user. Our software was strictly uh, PC. I don't recall if we ever sold the software or not. I don't think so. The in the in the books, volume one, the drawings were all made by hand. Norm Norm drew them. Eventually moved to where we could make we could turn out the drawings on the computer in, in the form that he could use in, in uh, PageMaker to put together a, a page. Norm, Norm, when he was using my software, uh, he, could, he could, sometimes he would have to force a design together which, which wasn't accurate. He could, he, he could come up with solutions which weren't proper solutions. So I wrote a verification routine which as soon as he, uh, as soon as he had enough data, the verification routine would run automatically. It turned, I sent it over to Norm, and uh, first time he ran, he says, you got a mistake, here's the software. He says, I got an error point, so-and-so on this facet. I said, well, if it says you got an error, Norm, you got an error. <laughs> 
And and instantly that is the basic routine of GEMCAD. My my program just checked the design and said you got an error. GEMCAD says I'll fix that error. GEMCAD uh, became the standard, and I was very happy that it came out because it was so much better to use than than my software. Uh, it was just head and shoulders above any any software that we had, we had. I cut some in high school and college, and uh, I cut like two or three round stones, and I went, I've got to cut something else. And so we ran across uh, an article in Rock and Gem on ovals, and uh, it had a method of cutting ovals with the custom index gear. So I cut a, cut a couple of ovals and got really interested in design, and, and I had a background in computer software. I have a bachelor's degree in physics. I went, hmm, this is... This is interesting. <laughs> this was appealing to me because it worked right. out the math for the angles around the stone and figure out what the angles were. So it was a lot closer to what we now consider to be meat point. And I went, you know, if I can do that, well, surely I can model the entire stone and work out angles and indexes for the whole thing. And so around 1985, 86 is whenever I first started on that. I guess I had a prototype of GEMCAD and uh, it was at least by 1986, ran on a mini computer in Fortran. The first design I did was bef actually before personal computers were powerful enough to run the software, really. I had in 1988. At that time, I, had, I was working on the C version of, of GEMCAD, and this was still in DOS. I'm not sure when it was introduced, but the IBM finally came out with a VGA display that could do 640 by 480 graphics, which was, <laughs> which was huge at that time because previously it was just awful graphics quality and it was not even bitmap. So it was very difficult to draw pictures on a early IBM PC. I got in touch with Walter Kars. He, at the time, he was the president of the Texas Fasteners Guild. And uh, he became a mentor on that. He was a competition ambassador. So he was in the community of uh, cutters that were doing the annual competition between the United States and, and Australia at that time. Famous battle. And that was the origin of the United States Ambassadors Guild. At that time, it was the United States Competition Ambassadors Guild. Uh, I premiered it at a meeting of the Texas Ambassadors Guild in 1989. It's one of our rough first started distributing the program. Other people okay. started using it. And Long and Steel, Bob Long in particular, worked with me on the format for the diagrams and the layout is a little bit peculiar, but it but the top and the two side views are like an engineering drawing, which is kind of nice. You can see things lining up in the two different views. Yeah, we collaborated a lot on that. First ray tracing program was based on mine. Uh, I, I, I wrote the crazy program, got it running, and then uh, eventually sent it to Robert. He, he reproduced it in C++, which is much faster than my, my basic. And then we compared notes and, and, and worked together until we got the identical results from both sets of software. They are ray tracing software. I, I worked on some DOS version of uh, Gemray also. And Bob Long and I worked together to get my software to agree with his because he had the standard at that time. Uh, their, their software would give a brightness value, and we worked on getting that. And Bob Long was also instrumental on how to handle the partial reflections properly. The idea of tracing a ray backwards through the stone is straightforward, but uh, you got to take all of the partial internal reflections into account as well. And it turns out if you follow all those backwards, it works out the same as going from the light source, but it takes care of all of that as, as well. The, the history of ray tracing uh, it started out with, uh, with a gentleman from, uh, from the Netherlands. Uh, he, he wrote a program in Pascal, which was ray, a ray tracing program. I think it was the first one ever done. And uh, he sent it to me. I was working for, with, uh, uh, Pete Van Zanten at the time, and he was a friend of Pete's. Van Zanten software ran on a, an Atari system. But it, it produced numbers. It didn't pr produce a picture. I took his, his software, converted it to, to basic, and added a picture. <laughs> that was the first ray tracing software with, with, with a picture, and, the, and the, the first one ever published. 
And if you look at that carefully, it, it, it only had uh, three types of rays, good, bad, or stopped. And we had to put stopped in there because if, if you're working with diamond, for example, a, a ray could run around forever. A few months later, I added a grayscale type of thing. It, the computers had no grayscale. So I had to use ASCII characters to, to simulate a grayscale. It started to spread to other clubs, and uh, Walter Karst was very key in that. He was in correspondence with a lot of people in the Pacific Northwest. Anyway, they had an annual conference, Northwest Ambassadors Club. And uh, I gave a presentation, would have been the summer of 1990. At the time, uh, people were really interested in it. It got good, good reaction. Well, there's a whole range of users some people never do any designing at all. They just use it as a, as a tool to manipulate diagrams or they'll make small changes or they'll just do tangent ratio scaling or to adapt to a piece of rough on the fly. Cut away some of your pavilion and you don't have enough left for the crown. So then you can squash the crown and get it out without making major changes to the design. And there's other people that will make minor changes and design. Some people will just use it for proof cutting. So you know, cut the stone virtually on the computer before doing it on the Facity machine to make sure that the diagram is correct. So I looked at GemCAD. I got the little 30-day trial and it was very confusing, but still managed to figure it out. And then ended up trialing my first, first design. Uh, and then after a couple of attempts of like just messing around, seeing it what worked. Um, I got a couple of designs that just really worked out really nice. And I was like, oh, so I can take the rough that I have where I just, I can't find any designs that fit it. I can just like draw the outline in GemCAD and then I can just randomly change things until it looks good. And that's basically how I got started. Working with GemCAD was basically a natural. I'd use multiple other computer-aided design programs. The thing about GemCAD or the thing about Gem Design in general is, is there's this wonderful feature. You can scale either the pavilion or the crown up and down of a gem without altering its face down appearance. That's something called tangent ratio scaling. And obviously that's used to optimize the performance of a gem depending on the material and, and your particular design goals. The way this is done is you pick one pavilion angle and one crown angle and you can adjust those and all of the others are then determined by those picks. In, in the case of GemCAD, it was just a case of it being a very classic data science kind of problem that you have two parameters. There's a reference pavilion angle and a reference crown angle and you adjust them in an automatic way so that you get what you want. So BOG stands for Better Optimizer for Gem, right? So that's where the name comes from. It's not a gem design program, it's an optimizer. It picks reference angle values to optimize the performance. And it in fact uses gem, gem ray to trace the light actually. You see the upper left and the lower right are the top and bottom, <clears throat> but the side views you can see the pavilion and crown stretching. And so when you do this with BOG, you drive gem ray basically to do that and you measure the performance of the gem. Basically the way BOG operates is it you know, for instance, in the, the x-axis here, it varies the pavilion angle, and then it measures what we call the merit function, which could be how bright the gem is or how well it performs when you tilt it and so forth. And if it gets better, it keeps changing that until it gets worse, and then it varies the crown angle, and then it goes back and forth and back and forth. This is a so-called grid search, and you can imagine it as a hiker trying to find his way to the top of a mountain. If he, you know, walks east and goes uphill until he's until he starts going downhill and then tries north-south and then east-west again and north-south again. And eventually you'll get to the top of this hill. And it's a very classic method and it's very stable. One of the issues is of course, is that if you end up on this hill here, um, you may have missed the best hill. Yeah, it was early days. So um, GemCAD was out, and but not uh, GemCAD for Windows. So the previous version, the blue one, GemRay for DOS was already out. And so it uses those. So there was probably a half a dozen people I was communicating with, including Robert, about it as it was as, as it was going forward. And uh, you know, I had a, a small cadre of uh, beta testers who helped a huge amount. So as a scientist, I have a certain viewpoint on how to approach problems, and they're not necessarily the best ones for the 
for the average uh, gem cutter. So that was very helpful. So yeah, it was an iterative process over over a period of, of months before we released it. Yeah. The US Fasteners Guild held a contest, a design contest um, for designing the best stone in terms of tilt performance. So, you know, basically that means that it should be, you know, if you just tilt it a little bit, it shouldn't go immediately dark, that it actually sparkles well and returns a lot of light at all angles. And that's something that Bog does extremely well. So that was used a fair amount, I think, in that contest for people to improve their designs for, for tilt. I had started doing a physical ray tracer myself, which was using, you know, the, fu the full physics and the full three-dimensional tracing rays and all that kind of stuff. It's a it was a lot of work. It, it did it did eventually work, and it was called a uh, pig. Picture your gemstone. You load up four gemcad files, and you tell them where you want them and their their color and their dispersion and so forth. Yeah, this never got far enough it's, to release. Whatever. I mean, it clear, clearly the landscape changed with the, when when Gemray Windows uh, came out. So I had a, a fair amount of communication uh, with Robert Strickland before and since. We've had a lot of discussions about how these things can can be improved and so forth. But yeah, he was very helpful in the early days of getting it to work. The connection to uh, Gemray was relatively easy in the times of DOS. It, it, you know, there were a few hidden things that I struggled with and, and talking with uh, Robert was really good with that too. Let's see, around 2001 is when I did GemCAD for Windows and I spent a man year on that. I spent, I did that pretty much full time for a year. I guess for the first few years, most of my customer base were people that had were already familiar with the DOS software. And then uh, Jim Ray for Windows was several years later. Uh, it was uh, in many ways much friendlier. Um, with GemCAD for DOS, there was a, a bunch of single keystroke commands. So you'd move the mouse around and then issue a command to find the nearest meet point uh, to the cursor on the screen and another one for the nearest edge and another one for the nearest facet. And so GemCAD for Windows kind of combined all that and all those point commands disappeared. So that simplified things. And a lot of that was from writing the dang instruction manual. It's, I found if something was hard to explain, it meant that the user interface was lousy and I needed to work on that. My goal has always been to make a diagram that's reproducible. If you're cutting a Vargas diagram, you will always have to make a decision. Are these cutting instructions right or is the picture right? Which one is right? My goal has always been to make a fascinating diagram that both the numbers and the pictures agree. Lots and lots of bitter debate about including uh, two decimal places on the angles, you know, to the hundredth of a degree. But that's what it takes to accurately reproduce a, a picture. If you don't have a hundredth of a degree, you will have to make a decision about whether the picture is right or whether the numbers are right. So I, I told one guy that was complaining about it, well, I'll send you a roll of uh, correction tape and you could just, just put the correction tape over that, that column of hundredths <laughs> and ignore them. <laughs> So I would meet up with uh, Bob Long and Robert Strickland every now and again at the Tucson Gem Show. We'd like to sit down and talk about fasting designs and different things that have been going on. Now, Reg, on the other hand, I met him when he was doing the alpha build of GemCut Studio. We had dinner at Tucson and he showed me on like a tablet all the different things he was coming up with. And we've exchanged a very large number of emails and we've had some intermittent video chats here and there. The whole thing started with threads on Gemology Online and then chatting with a bunch of people from there. For most of my life as a programmer, I had worked creating tools for artists. So, you know, sort of dabbling in whatever artistic field they were in, but not being, not pretending to myself that I was ever going to make a career out of it, but just having that connection to the artist. You know, I used to love this stuff and it's so, you know, the, the marvel of shiny rocks and crystals and things and collected these nice rocks and said, well, how do you actually go about making them, you know, shiny and faceted and kind of looking that up and then whipping something together with a bunch of PVC tubing and an old flat lap and figuring out how, I, you know, I could actually cut something, then learning the software and then saying, well, I'd like to have a go at making this kind of software too. I think I've got some ideas that, you know, some of this stuff like, well, the technology's moved on. Maybe some of these things that were unthinkable back then you know, computers could do that easily now, couldn't they? I mean, oh, it's, it's, I just got to scratch that itch. So uh, I set about writing, you know, at first just kind of a ray tracer, see if I could kind of tack on to something that GemCAD had done 
And so maybe if you went into like sort of writing my own Gemray and you would save your file in Gemcad and then this would kind of detect that the file's been updated and just automatically update the render and always have that render in the wind. And then you could spin it around and see it from different angles. That really excited me. Like, well, what else could we do? You know, what about cutting? Like instead of cutting your facet and planning where your cut's going to happen, what about if you, as you were cutting in, you could see what the effect on the gem would be. You know, for certain things, there's no point. It might just be eye candy, but seeing the cut come in and seeing the reflections, the virtual facets move around in the gem just has that kind of really magical, powerful feel to it. Relying less on things like undoing, um, relying less on people making mistakes and having to backtrack on their mistakes. And that's, you know, the magical world of software. We can do things that aren't possible. You know, I'm, I'm very much in the school of, you know, don't copy, but definitely borrow good ideas. If things work, that's fine. And yeah, so I was just sort of focused on things that maybe I didn't like about my experience learning GemCAD, things like, you know, setting things up and I thought it was right and then hitting a button and then some error that I didn't quite understand came up and I knew it did something wrong, but maybe wasn't really told what was wrong. You know, it's time to go back to the community and see, would people want something like this? Is there a need for it? Or are there enough people to even justify doing this? Is it, at the time, the Gemology Online forums was the place where all this was happening. And, you know, even looking at archives, you can see that people have kind of made sort of false starts at like, hey, could we could we get some kind of new software going? You know, we would need this and this and this. So there's a lot of information that you could just kind of um, lurk around and, and pull and, and make notes of and things and already get a good sense of from some of the really productive discussions people had had before I even came on board, started reaching out. Uh, to some of the people on the forum and, you know, guys like Aria who'd been around forever and, and had a, long, a lot of strong ideas and, you know, kind of like, awesome, someone's listening, I've got things to say. The layout of the PDFs, like of the printouts in GemCut Studio are because I basically sent him an Excel spreadsheet and I was like, hey, Reg, please make this your new layout before you publish like the first, like the, the first iteration of GemCut Studio. Can you like make this a thing? And he was willing to accommodate. So he stuck that in there. And that's the only reason that that's the new format. Um, and that, that kind of turned into, well, you should come to Tucson because that's where all these people will be. And if you want to meet this guy and this guy and this guy, well, they'll all be at Tucson. Um, so I kind of hurriedly planned a trip, you know, to Tucson across the world uh, to try to meet with as many people as I could. So I got to talk to a lot of people and, and certainly, you know, quickly get a feel of how people actually worked. Quickly came to the realization that people were sort of expecting almost all of whatever was in GemCat and GemRay right away because all that stuff they rely on and they need it there. So if I'm coming out with something and it doesn't have that, don't bother. I only ever met uh, Robert. He attended one of my talks when I presented the software at the uh, Facetters Frolic. He was around that day. And I introduced myself after his talk. I've got this new software out. He's like, yeah, I've heard of it. I've not tried it yet. But uh, yeah, I'll be sticking around for your talk. So, you know, that's a little bit of pressure for me knowing he's in the audience. And uh, we had a little bit of a chat and I asked him some questions like things about the industry or rather the software industry that I'd be really curious about. Um, and he's happy to talk about it. And we talked about some little technical details of things that, you know, like you would know, you know, how, how, how did you do this? You don't have to tell me, but he's like, no, no, no. I, yeah, I did this. You do it the same way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. You know, it's kind of stuff that no one else would understand what you were talking about when you say it. I saw him demonstrate it in Tucson and I was very impressed. More power to him. I mean, <laughs> he has done a lot that I would have liked to have done, but just didn't have the time or gumption to do. So another one from the community that I managed to talk to when I went to Tucson was Tom Herbst. And he wrote a uh, software, uh, an optimizer back in the day that kind of did my idea was it's sort of like, I call them like parasite apps. Like you're not really officially sanctioned. You're just grabbing someone else's data and trying to do something with it in a way that doesn't, you know, detract from them or steal from them. But it's just another way of presenting the same data. And he had his optimizer that he wrote. And there was a lot of great stuff in there. And um, so I, I, I said, you know, is there any way we can talk about some of the stuff you did with Bog? And I'm, you know, I'm writing new software. Do you want to collaborate? Do you want to do anything? And um, I had a good chat with uh, Tom. We had lunch and we, we chatted. And, uh, you know, the, the conclusion of it was that while he really enjoyed what he did, I don't think he wants to do it again. 
And he's happy for me just to steal any good ideas that he had. And I kind of, I kind of walked away with his blessing to just blatantly rip off any good ideas he had. So some of that went into, uh, you know, some of the optimizer I did for, for Genka studio and some of this stuff is still coming up in the future, I think. And then uh, Robert Long, we've had conversations on Facebook where, you know, he, he'll raise something that maybe something that's been kind of forgotten to the, the current generation of faceters discussing things on Facebook. And he's like, hang on, we solved this years ago, or we used to have this. How come we don't have this anymore? And, and I love, uh, you know, seeing that and saying, well, that's a challenge. Maybe I can get that in mind. How much work would that be? You know, there was a conversation recently where he, he threw out this way of visualizing optimizations. And, and I just just dropped everything I was working on and just went on and, and see, saw if I could whip something up in mind just to throw something back into the conversation of like, well, is this what you mean? Like, again, I'm, I, I don't exactly know what this was used for because it certainly probably wasn't born back then. Um, so there's still people like him around and, and still, still pushing the craft forward. The, the best thing you hope for is to see that you know some idea you might have had of giving someone an extra little bit of tool or an extra thing they can change in the way that it's modeled that will create an explosion of creativity and that will lead to new things i i think the best example of that would be that the frosting i did in my renderer just started as like well the, you know there's a couple of frosted designs and people like to make little I don't know, ribbons and things like that, the, the Texas star, but it was always seen as a bit of a, a curiosity. And, and I, I still said about doing it, can we plan around how reflections of frosted designs will work? Things have happened now that I never thought would happen. Uh, that There's been an explosion of designs on Facebook for frosted stuff. It's really complex reflections that generate, you know, amazing snowflake patterns from really simple frosted lines that then get re reflected and mirrored into a really complex virtual facets. And I'd kind of like to think, well, that's just because that one little feature was added to software to actually let people see it. You know, it's the same way that, that the first early ray tracers finally let people play around with angles and see what that might look like. And like, there's no way to imagine the complex reflections that happen inside a gem without seeing it. And that kind of ties into Sean O'Neill who wrote the little froster. I actually got started with making designs before I start fasting. I thought that, that playing with the design software was very helpful for understanding the process for cutting the actual gems. When I was using GemCAD, I thought, this doesn't seem that complicated. I could probably make something like this myself. There were some features that I thought were missing, and I tried to make my own software for it. It took me a few months, and I didn't end up releasing it, but I did, I did make it functional, and I ended up using it for making my own designs for a while. Before I released it, I wanted to check if anyone else had made something similar because I thought, you know, if this is so easy that I can do it in a few months, surely someone else has already done it. And then I found Jim Cut Studio and it's like, oh, okay, there it is. And so I, I ended up using Jim Cut Studio and I thought it was really good, really well made. But uh, I just got some idea for the frosted edges. Frosting individual edges is a newer thing. It's not quite the same as when you're designing like an image of a butterfly or whatever. And I thought if someone wanted to do this on a more complicated design, it would be a lot of work, but it's something that could be done pretty automatically. You know, if you just know what, what size you want the edges to be. So I wrote a smaller program that did that. I called it a uh, edge frosting tool, which is kind of just a placeholder name in the background. It actually uses the original functionality of the fasting design program that I had. It, it loads in the file and then it, it cuts all the edge facets individually and then it saves it. It's just using Jimcat Studio's file format, which is a lot simpler to use than Jimcat. Jimcat's is, is really hard to read. When it loads in the design, it, it figures out where all the facets are. And in the process, it figures out where all the points and the edges are. And once you know where all the edges are, you can figure out what angle and index to use for that edge. And so you just cut at that angle and index and you have to figure out the right height to use, which is one the more tricky part because you have to figure out the height to use to get the, the right uh, width of the edge. I didn't expect it to be so popular, I guess. Um, though it's hard to tell who, who's actually used it and who just made the designs and then shared them. I mean, I, I do see some designs every once in a while where it's like, oh yeah, that is most likely made using this software. <laughs> And that's, that's really interesting. I look forward to seeing more designs with that kind of feature.
you have to have an inspiration. Either there's a need, someone has asked you for a type of design, or there's a need for some shape. Norm was kind of the librarian of the pair, and uh, he would put out, a, I guess it was the Facet Digest or something like that. It was part of the Seattle yeah, yeah. Facet, or, and he would have in the back of that a digest of diagrams that had been published. And so over the years, they collected scads of designs, you know, hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of designs. No, the database, that was Norm's hobby, you might say. Any, any design he published, he had to put into, into the database. And, and Norm would, would have to try to take the numbers and the drawing and try to put them together and, and come up with a design which would go together that kind of followed what the author originally started with. His first version of the database was like what I call the, the knitting needle de- database. Eight and a half by 11 cards with cutouts you have in a box. You put a knitting needle in, lift them up, anything still in a box, that's your criteria. That was his database. <laughs> and most of those were, were in their proprietary format for their software. Whenever we wanted to send a copy of the database to somebody, there was a bitmap image that was a, it's probably a, a GIF file at that time. And then the GEMCAD file, it took a stack of floppy diskettes to send a thing by mail to somebody. <laughs> so uh, I worked with Bob Long on a thumbnail sketch format file. It was a binary file. It was a low resolution 3D format. And uh, you could represent all of the f- meet points and edges of a file of a facet in just a few hundred bytes. With that and with Jimcat's ASCII format, instead of a stack of 20 disks, you could get it on a stack of about five diskettes. So that was really my first collaboration with Bob was in working out the thumbnail sketch file for that. And I persuaded him to convert it to the old DBF format, which was the standard at the time. But he still, he had a passion. He had to put anything that published, he had to put it in his database. He sold copies at $5 a copy. As a part of Seattle Fasting Books, it consisted of uh, five floppies. These were compressed files. That's when I wrote DataView. Uh-huh. That's how you could access the, the database. The database itself was a DBF. And then there was the uh, Stowe file, which are, which are library files, and the, and the uh, THB files, which are thumb, thumbnail files. So I wrote DataView and, and made it available to the public. Made Darren Arms database, which is only available to somebody that visited his basement, and I made it available to the world. In the late 1990s, he had his own data view program that ran I mean, before Windows 95. <laughs> <laughs> it used that, that format. So Norm Steele maintained that for until his death. And each year, there would come out with an update disk. And so you'd have the five canonical <laughs> ones that had most of the database, and then one additional disk that had uh, updates. Uh, it made it easy to maintain the, the whole database. And then after Norm Steele's death, uh, John Frankie in the Pacific Northwest, he runs a website called uh, gemcutter.com and was very active at that time in the hobbyist community. Okay. And uh, he took over maintaining the database after Norm Steele's death. At the time, I wasn't able to, to handle the, uh, the updates, so it was turned over to, to John Frankie, and he, for a while, did the updates to the database. And with all the publication now, it, it's, it's a daily job to add anything that comes out uh, ha- has to be added to the database. And then the copyright lawsuit threats began. <laughs> So part of the problem with the fasting community in terms of design availability is that a lot of people will take their designs and they'll view them as something that's like inherent to them or is like a sales advantage or business advantage. They won't make those designs publicly available or they even dislike the idea that designs are made publicly available. And I think that's something that disadvantages us as a community. Not necessarily all of your designs are not necessarily like the best of your designs. But having more designs available and out there means that people are more likely to kind of take an idea, get inspired by it, and produce something new and kind of run with it. Um, There's a couple of new faceters who I know have taken the idea of frosting and really run with it. But if people hadn't been publishing the concept of frosting designs or the first couple of designs that had frosting on them, or the new trend with having frosted edges between facets, 
if people hadn't posted the first couple of attempts at that and they hadn't put up the software to be able to do that, then we would never have had this massive expansion of this trend, which not only like gives us new ideas to work with or to play around with, but also expands the total market. So with these new ideas, people who are like, oh, like gems are interesting, I would buy one, are suddenly seeing, oh, there's like concave faceting or fantasy cutting or frosted designs. Um, and suddenly you've taken a pre-existing market and you've grown a new niche or you've grown, like you've attracted people to the market as buyers who otherwise wouldn't consider it. The person that had bought the Vargas books after their death was upset about it. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't remember all the history. And then some designers were just incredibly pissed that their designs were <laughs> included in the database without their permission. Someone complained about uh, copyright infringement, and that uh, caused Frankie to uh, remove a lot of stuff from the database and actually get out of the database business. So there were some people who, who were concerned about uh, uh, ownership of the diagrams. Uh, no one that I, I know of uh, ever registered a copyright. They're all copyrighted. Once you create one and publish it, it's copyrighted automatically. But that, but you have to register it in order to, to file a lawsuit in, in federal court. It's free always federal. been essentially free. It's been a nominal fee for Just copying this. discs and mailing them around the world. But <laughs> okay. yeah, it's always been free. The copyright right law is varies by country, but it's a very fuzzy area of whether you could copyright a faceting diagram or not and what you're actually copywriting when you do copyright the diagram because essentially it's something that's intended to be copied in three dimensions so <laughs> the whole thing that kind of was the death of data the lost lawsuits frankie said i'm not dealing with this anymore and stop maintaining it one of the things about data view is that you know a lot of new cutters will come in and they'll they might have heard of it but you can't find it anymore there's copyright issues surrounding it a lot of people say, what about data view? And I'm like, well, I don't even have data view. I've, I've heard of it. I know what it is, but I don't have it because, you know, I haven't bought it. And they're like, oh, no, no, we, we, we have a right to, to distribute it. So you, you can, someone will get it to you and, and we'd love for you to support it. So, yeah, I knew what it was and I knew that, you know, you could browse it through uh, Gemcad. And I knew that it, it sort of existed as facet diagrams, but not all the designs were in it. So most of the Aussie cutters wanted support for this. You know, with with the files in hand, again, it kind of went back into, well, what is this file format? You know, it, nothing's documented, but it's easy enough to figure out once you kind of look at numbers and you can figure out, and, you know, there's text in there, things you can recognize when you're looking. So it took me about a week, but I went back and, and kind of reversed all these file formats, which is obviously some, some database format that was created um, specifically for this. But because it's not really evolving anymore and, and not being added to, it's sort of a snapshot in time. Supporting it just means supporting what's out there now. So it's easy to know if you've got it right or not. It doesn't mean that, you know, if someone were to re-add files to it, maybe that would break. But I said about to having it inside Gemcut Studio, and then that opens it up to every, you know, Australian faceter who's got that design database to be able to use it for their, their purposes and just kind of carry on as though it was a gem file or a Gemcut Studio file. So that was the state of affairs for probably a decade. And then um, Will Smith soon to be president of the United States Faster Guild. And he started bugging us about seeing if we could get this thing online somehow. We started working really hard on getting all of the files in data view, uh, try to get permission from all the designers that we could to include their designs. All the designs that are were in data view were transferred over to facetdiagrams.org. And then um, the ones that we could get the permission of the designers, we, we put those in the open category so you can view the diagrams and download the designs. And I had hoped that the thing would just kind of take off by itself at that time. Uh, at that time, other online libraries were becoming popular. And so it's, it's kind of foundered in the past few years. Not a lot of submissions. Facetdiagrams.org is a very good comprehensive repository. Um, it has like a huge number of historic designs. Um, some modern designs here and there as people kind of send them to Bob Strickland. Um, but I think the Gemology Project's fasting diagram page has the actual like visualizations, it has renders, it has test cuts, um, it has commentary from people who are putting their designs up there. And I think it's because the number of designs on there is more limited and it's exclusively current designs, like designs from the past eight to 10 years at, at the oldest, I think 
it's a little bit easier to find designs that you know are going to work or are going to be easily reproducible. I think there's a, um, because passiddiagrams.org does such a good job of having that comprehensive, complete set of all designs or like a very, very extensive set of designs. There's a lot of designs in there that I would venture to say are not necessarily the most easily reproducible. I need to get rid of facetdiagrams.org and get somebody else to maintain it and enhance it some. I, w- I would love to get out from under that, get it into somebody else's hands because it, if, if I don't, it'll just die when I'm not able to maintain it anymore. If, if I could get some collaboration on that, that would be wonderful. I think if you were to find a cohort of people in the like 15 to 40 range in terms of age, like a cohort of like five or six of them, who are all interested either in fasting or designing or just like some combination thereof, I think you would get together a really good team who would be able to A, put that together and B, have it become sustainable and ongoing. So curated designs, uh, designs that include the renders and or test cuts, the ability for independent users to upload their own test cuts of pre-existing designs or upload their own new designs, Um, some kind of active content portion where there's like a design of the month or like a beginner section that's like, here are designs that are good for beginners or a section that's like, here are historical designs by year or by like these historic authors and designs, things like that. I would like to open source GemCAD as a web application, but I'm not sure if I have the software smarts to do that anymore. I know at my prime as a programmer, that was probably around you know <laughs> in the late 90s <laughs> okay. i don't know where we're headed i think we've gone in the wrong direction in some some ways like uh, i don't like the emphasis on meat points even though i <laughs> kind of responsible for <laughs> i think it, it 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 encourages pushing facets to, to come to a meat point which doesn't really exist it, it encourages ruining the flatness of a facet in order to, to satisfy the judges that's that's wrong so there's obviously things that will improve you know the new technologies there's stuff we don't know exists yet that will exist that will open things up but more short term like for me you know things like well what happens when we open up the possibility of modeling concave or fantasy cuts will that open up the rest of you know the faceters world to all of a sudden getting into concave and coming up with amazing designs that we didn't know could exist that keeps me up at night those kind of things like I wish I wish I had more time to to make the tools for them the, the creatives to actually hammer it and and throw their their brains at it and and come up with amazing things. So I think within the fasting community, the number of people who actually do their own design work is pretty limited still. At least from what I've seen from like 2010 onto now, there's been a definite pickup in terms of the number of people writing designs now that GemCut Studio is out. I think the learning curve for uh, GemCAD, even though GemCAD is a little bit more powerful, the learning curve for it was a lot steeper. But now that GemCAD Studio exists and it gives you kind of that immediate real-time feedback, I think people are a little bit more willing to put themselves out there. So there's a lot of fasteners who will take pre-existing designs and cut those, or they'll come up with like one or two designs that they then kind of stick with and will cut almost exclusively. But I think there's a little bit of room for growth in the community. I think encouraging people to put out their designs will build more of a community of additional people learning how to design or kind of expand that side of the community as well. In these times, it's a little hard to believe, but you know, the, the people you were mentioning earlier, like Bob Long and, and Robert and, and, and Reg Poirier and, and Aria and so forth, I've actually met all in person, which is kind of hard to believe given where we are in the world. My experience has been that, it, that, that, that yeah, people are very sharing and, and open. Yeah, yeah, it's really good. You know, future advances in uh, computing power will lead to, you know, better rendering. I've played around with some of the better rendering, but it's not there at real time yet. So maybe it's going into, you know, more of an offline thing where you can just make a really nice image to send to you a client rather than relying on that in real time. But, you know, in 10 years, they're going to laugh at that and say, well, of course you can do that in real time. You can you can generate a hundred times the work. That's, that's no problem. The, the, the technology moves forward like that. You know, will virtual reality find any use in, in gem cutting? Will people be karate chopping facets on a virtual floating gem in front of them instead of 
tweaking sliders. And, you know, if you look at, if you consider what we're all used to, buttons and knobs, you know, just the touch screen has, has kind of exploded all that and saying, well, you know, typing things into a box and using, uh, clicking on a button for things, it's okay, but it's the way that we used to do things. And now we've got multi-touch and that's way better than inputting, you know, uh, a, a size on something, just grab it and move it. So there's things like that. If we build it, they will come, you know, they'll, they'll be people. If this becomes such an advantage in a workflow or in, in design possibilities, then people will jump on it. It'll be a good thing.